All right, so we're preaching through the Bible chronologically. We're at the tail end of the Old Testament. Can I get an amen and a hallelujah? I've loved the Old Testament. I've loved the character studies, really how to do it right more times than not, how to do it incorrectly and how we can learn from that because that's really my life that I've lived, right? People ask Tiffany and me for parenting tips. I say, well, we'll tell you everything that we did wrong and you can learn from that and go and improve on that. So that's really what we've seen in the Old Testament. We're gonna wrap it up today in the book of Zechariah. It's the second to last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah and Haggai, they're, they're prophesying in a time. Last week we looked at really the Babylonians coming to destroy not only the temple, but really all of Jerusalem and carry most of the Israelites to captivity. And Jeremiah had told us that was gonna be a 70 year period. And people knew that prophecy. And so they were holding on, they were counting the days for when they would leave the exile and return to Jerusalem and rebuild the Israelite nation basically as, as they knew it 70 years prior. And today we're talking about that time. We're talking about Zechariah was saying, hey, it's time to rebuild. The 70 years is over. Persia has come and conquered Babylon and given us our freedom. And we have the opportunity to go back and build. Now, Zechariah is an unusual book. It, toward the end, there's going to be some Messianic prophecy that talks about uh, the Messiah riding on a donkey and other things that you're going to be familiar with. But really, at the beginning, he's encouraging the Israelite people, the people of Judah, to go back and to get busy and rebuild the temple. He does it by recording eight of his dreams. I don't know about your dreams. My dreams typically don't make sense. Okay, I could be under the sea with somebody from high school and all of a sudden Dr. Young walks in and all of a sudden we're in the big city and then I'm in a house that I grew up in and I wake up and go, where did that come from? They're unusual. Well, his dreams are unusual too, but his dreams have a point. His dreams have a lesson. And for us to understand, we're only gonna study one dream in one chapter of Zechariah and it's gonna have a phenomenal point to challenge and change us this morning. But I wanted you to get an overview of the eight dreams and instead of me describing them, some of you are visual learners, so there's a, a thing called the Bible Project and what they're gonna do is illustrate these eight dreams. So y'all watch this illustration of Zachariah's eight dreams. The next large section is a collection of eight nighttime visions that Zechariah experienced. And just to prepare you, these are full of very bizarre, strange images, a lot like your dreams. The idea that God communicates to people through symbolic dreams, it's very old. It goes back to the book of Genesis. The dreams of Jacob or Joseph or Pharaoh, these gave meaning to current events at the time, but they also gave a window into the future. And so Zechariah has his own dreams now, and they've been arranged in this really cool symmetrical design. The first and the last visions are about four horsemen each. They're like rangers patrolling the world on God's behalf, and it's a representation of God's attentive watch over the nations. Their report is that the world is at peace. And in Zechariah's day, this refers to how God raised up Persia to conquer Babylon and bring peace. And so the question now arises, the 70 years of Israel's exile are almost up. Is now the time for the Messianic kingdom in Jerusalem? And God responds by saying that he's determined to fulfill those promises, but he leaves the question of timing unanswered. The second and seventh visions are paired because they're both reflections on Israel's past sin that led up to the exile. So the second vision is about these horns that symbolize the nations that attacked and then scattered Israel, Assyria and Babylon. But then these horns or empires are themselves scattered by a group of blacksmiths, an image for Persia. The seventh dream is about a woman in a basket, and we're told that she's a symbol of the centuries of Israel's covenant rebellion. And then this woman is carried off to Babylon by other women who carry the basket flying with stork wings. This is so strange. The third and sixth visions are paired as they're both about the rebuilding of a new Jerusalem. So a man is measuring the city. It's an image of God's promise that Jerusalem will be rebuilt and become a beacon to the nations who will join God's people in worship. And then the sixth dream is about a scroll that flies around the new Jerusalem, punishing thieves and liars. The idea being that the new Jerusalem is a place that's purified from sin by the scriptures. The fourth and fifth visions are at the center of this collection, and they're about the two key leaders among the returned exiles. So Joshua, the high priest, and then Zerubbabel, the royal descendant of David. 
So Joshua had been symbolically wearing Israel's sin in the form of these dirty clothes. But then those are taken off and he's given new clothes and a new turban, a symbol of God's grace and forgiveness. And then an angel tells Joshua that if he remains faithful to God, he will lead his people and Joshua will become a symbol of the future messianic king. The other vision is about two olive trees that supply oil to this elaborate gold lamp, which itself is a symbol of God's watchful eye over his people. And these two trees symbolize the two anointed leaders, Joshua and then Zerubbabel, who's leading the temple rebuilding efforts. And God says that success will not come to this new temple if it's the result only of political maneuvering. Rather, these two leaders must be dependent upon the work of God's spirit. The visions come to a close with a bonus vision from the prophet, and it picks up the themes of the central fourth and fifth visions. It's Joshua, the high priest again, and he's given a crown and presented as a symbol of the future Messiah who will also be a priest over God's kingdom. And then Zechariah closes it all out saying that all of these visions will be fulfilled only if the current generation is faithful to God and obeys the terms of the covenant. And so altogether, these three visions emphasize how the coming of the Messianic kingdom is conditional upon this generation being faithful to God. Okay, we finally found somebody who could draw as fast as Matt can talk, all right? But hopefully for our visual learners, that's kind of puts these eight dreams alive, and we're gonna look specifically at dream number five, the olive trees and the the lampstand and the candles, and really explain how that applies to our lives here thousands of years later. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Zechariah chapter four, and we're gonna look at really three things that Zechariah, I guess, is illustrating through these dreams that challenges the Israel people, the Israelite people, and challenges us this morning. So Zechariah 4, 1 says, Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who is wakened out of sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? Okay, what do you see? The first thing that we see right here through the crazy dreams is a picture. What do you see? And, and the picture was illustrated there very well with there is a lampstand and, and some candles and a gold bowl and, and these two olive trees that have basically 49 different uh, filler spouts going to the seven candles. And he says, what do you see? And the picture, the overall picture of the eight dreams plus the bonus dream is that God is in the restoration business. God has basically walked with his people for centuries of disobedience and rebellion. God has seen some kings get it right. God has seen some prophets be be basically successful in turning the people and leading the people. He has also seen rebellion and disobedience. He's seen his people turn his back and worship other gods. He has seen his people very quickly after the the restoration and reconciliation and the love and the mercy poured out on them turn their backs and chase after the world's idols. But the overall picture is regardless of how disobedient and rebellious my people have been, I am still in the restoration business. And the picture here is the people have returned to Jerusalem And the first thing they did very selfishly is they went back and they rebuilt their own homes. And God says, time out, Zerubbabel, and and basically the prophets and, and the kings, why are you focusing on your own personal things when my house, my temple, my place of worship is in destruction? You started it four years ago. And for decades, you've been working on the foundation, but you haven't finished it. And I want to restore my temple. Why? Because I want to be the priority of my people. I desire to be number one. Yes, homes are important. Yes, jobs are important. But the priority of the Israel's focus, the priorities of us today in America as Christ followers needs to be the Lord, his worship, his name, his renown, his glory. And he says, I want your focus. The picture of what I'm painting is I want to be the priority because I am in the restoration business. He said, the Israelites, you as individuals have hearts that have turned away from me. You as families have been destroyed because I have not been the priority. You as a nation 
have been basically displaced for 70 years in a foreign land because you continued to disobey and to rebel. And God says, I want to restore the individual. I want to restore the family. I want to restore a nation. And glory to God that he is still in the restoration business. He still desires to restore. He still desires to pour into your life and my life and change us and allow us to grow in him. The picture that Zechariah paints is that our Lord is still in the restoration business. There has to be a purpose. And if you look at it right there, the purpose is really for us to shine, fueled by God's power. We'll continue reading right there. He says, so I said, this is Zechariah reporting on his vision, the dream that he saw. I am looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on, the le- on its left. So I answered and spoke and he talked to me. What are these, Lord? Then the angel who talked, to me, uh, talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? Now this is where my sarcastic side has to take a side. He basically asked the angel, and keep in mind this is God's spoke person, spokesperson, so you can't be sarcastic, but he said, what are these? And the angel said, you don't know what they are? No, that's why I asked you. Three times in this short chapter, he says, I don't know what this is. And the angel replies, you don't know what it is? No, that's why I'm asking you, okay? This, that's just my own mind trying to interpret scripture here. It says that, do you not know what these are? And he said, no, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That's probably the most famous passage in all of Zechariah. Not by power or by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And the purpose right here is the fact that we cannot rebuild without the help and the source and the strength and the wisdom of the Lord. We cannot do it. Zerubbabel couldn't do it. Zechariah couldn't do it. Joshua couldn't do it. The people could not do it if it was simply their own political maneuvering or their own building uh, ability. They could not rebuild the temple in Jerusalem without the help of the Spirit. Now looking forward, this is an incredible passage because if you look at the vision, the two olive trees that were on each side had basically pipes that were going to the candle. It was the priest's job to to continue to fill the candles and the oil lamps up with the oil so that they could burn continuously. But in this vision, as, as in a future vision of Jesus Christ and his power giving us the Holy Spirit, basically says in the future, once Christ comes as our great high priest, once he gives every Christ follower the power of the Holy Spirit, we will no longer have to go to the priest to be filled up. We will have the Holy Spirit in us through us, living in us, filling us with what we need to shine and shine brightly. We don't have to have a mediator to pray for us or to fill us. We have the beautiful gift of the Holy Spirit. And this picture is those two trees pouring the the oil directly into the lamps that they will never run out and they will continually be able to shine for Jesus Christ. Our goal in life is to shine with the power of God and not by our own strength, our own efforts, our own measure. And that is a beautiful picture of our purpose on this earth as we try to help God as workmen. And I thought of really the greatest picture in in this kind of overarching theme is the extreme makeover home edition. Although that show's so old, I don't even know what Ty's doing right now. So let's, let's bring it forward. How about Chip and JoJo, okay? Any, anybody Fixer Upper fans out there? Yeah, there we go, they're over there. They're seated over there. Y'all are my sports fans. You know, I once said I think I used too many sports analogies and to the person replied, you, cannot, you can never use too many sports analogies. So there's an HGTV for all you non-sports folks that like Chip and JoJo. But it, what's amazing is you go to these houses and I can't believe that all of Waco hasn't been restored by now, but, but they, you have the help, you have a, a homeowner, they, they buy this house, they say this is the house I want, but it's not the house I want. I want this house, this family, but, I, but I, want, I want you to make it into basically a brand new house. 
And that's exactly the picture that we have here is you need someone coming in from the outside with the vision, God's vision of the man or woman he's created you to be. With the source and the power and the ability to change and restore something that is old and run down and not as, as purposeful as what it could be. Now, I'm always amazed at those show, shows at the vision of the people when they come in and say, we can knock this wall out, we can do this right here, and all of a sudden, man, it just looks fantastic. God, infinitely more than that, wants to take your life and to restore it and change it and improve it so that you could be the man or the woman that he's created you to be. He is the great restorer. And he desires to pour into you his spirit, his ability, his strength, his power so that you can shine brightly for him. Not so that you can achieve great things for your own glory and for your own advancement, so that you, just like the lampstand and the bowl and the seven candles or the seven lamps, the purpose of that was to be in the temple shining brightly on God's glory. And when God fills you with his power and his strength and his spirit, it's not simply so that you can achieve, it's so that you can shine. And centuries later, Jesus would tell a group of people sitting on the side of a, a lake, he says, therefore let your light shine before men so they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven, Matthew 5.14. That is the goal, that is the purpose. If we see the big picture of God wants to restore you, change you, grow you, so that you can shine effectively, brightly for his glory, so that you can point people to him and his glory and his restoration. Because, you know, I guarantee you those homes on, in the middle of Waco that Chip and Joe go and they, they restore and they give a total facelift to, and sometimes they gut them and, and build out the inside. I can tell you who feels the pressure, right? The next door neighbors. Okay, they walk home every day, they, they go, man, look at how good their house looks. Okay, you hate to be that person on the, in, on the block that everyone does their yard on Thursday and you're waiting till Saturday, but when you drive home Thursday night and everybody's looks pristine and yours looks like a jungle, you go, man, maybe tonight I need to do my yard. I don't care if it's 110 degrees, I gotta go mow my yard. Because when you start letting God's light shine in you, you know what it does to other people around you? Man, I see how they respond. I see the hope they have. I see the love they have for the unlovable. I see how they're full of grace and mercy instead of anger and rage. I see a difference in that man. I see, I see something special in that woman and I want that. You know why? Because when they see your light shining, They'll want to understand the source of your brightness. And that source is the Holy Spirit. When he is tapped in you and shining through you, others will see that and they'll question and they'll desire to have that same glow, that same hope that you have. That's the purpose for us to shine and shine brightly. And the last thing is really the task. And it's pretty interesting. The task was to finish it. God told Zechariah, and he told Zerubbabel, and he told Joshua, you've got to finish this. You've been working on it for years. It took him four more years to actually build it. You need to finish the task. And this is basically, there, there's two things. In verse seven, it says, this is your first obstacle that you have to get over. It says, who are you, O great mountains? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. He said basically you're gonna see mountains along this way. God is calling you to finish it. He's given you the power and equipping you to do the work, but there are still mountains. God, and this is our parenting tip for the day, God does not prepare the path for the person, he prepares the person for the path. And that's what we need to do as parents. We don't need to simply just pave away the path and try to make it so easy for our kids that they never fail, that they never struggle, that they never face opposition or obstacles. But instead, if we strengthen our children and if God strengthens us as his children, then when there are mountains, we have the strength and the endurance to climb through them, to overcome them. And he says, man, there are mountains in front of us. Do not let those mountains slow you down. 
And there are mountains, there were definitely mountains for them to rebuild the temple. And in, in about 70 years later, when Nehemiah tries to rebuild the wall, there are tons of mountains and obstacles and opposition in their way. And God says, you're tapped into my spirit. You've got my power. You've got my strength. I am equipping you. Don't worry about the mountains. You'll, you'll make those mountains seem like they're, they're the plains. We, as Christ followers, have to roll up our sleeves and realize that it takes work. If God is gonna restore you as an individual and you're dealing with addiction, God's not simply gonna take the desire away, but he's gonna give you the strength and the courage and the power to overcome that addiction. If God's trying to restore your marriage just because you say, God, help my marriage, it's struggling, it's, it's so frustrating, it's not what I imagined, that Disney fairy tale ending. God's not simply gonna snap his finger and every disagreement you have, every, everything that is between you and your spouse just disappears. But he's gonna give you the strength and the power and the courage and sometimes the patience to endure and roll up your sleeves and work at marriage because marriage takes work. And man, when we look at our nation and we go, man, it's just beyond fixer-upper. We can't bring in Chip and JoJo and they fix this nation because it's such a mess. God says it takes work. It is a mountain and you have to overcome the obstacles you have to stand tall and shine brightly so that you and I can make a difference in restoring this nation. God wants to restore, but he wants to use us as his tools and his light. And then not only the obstacles, he also says something very interesting right there. We cannot overlook the small steps. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, for who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the, the hand of Zerubbabel, the eyes of the Lord. Basically, he says, don't skip the small steps. He says, when you're rebuilding this temple, it's gonna be great to lay that capstone on, that finishing project. It's gonna be great to, to lay the big pillars, but who's gonna do the little steps? And God says, in my restoration work, there are huge, giant leaps, and there's those small, tiny steps. And when we try to build God's kingdom and shine brightly in this northwest section of Houston. It's gonna require some great people to stand up and shine brightly and it's gonna take some people who are equally as great doing the small things behind the scenes to make sure that everything can happen to bring restoration back to our land, to your family, to you as an individual. Restoration takes giant leaps and small, small steps. And it takes, basically, he's telling Zechariah, don't overlook the small things. Don't get so focused on the big vision that you forget the small little steps that, re that are required for you to rebuild my temple, to bring glory back to my name. So I think sometimes we can get so big vision casted and we see the big picture and we wanna take these big things and man, if I could only speak or if I only had this platform or if I could only had this position and God's saying, don't overlook those little things. There are little steps in the process that you need to take care of before the big things can ha happen. And basically he says, I want to restore my kingdom. It takes climbing mountains, it takes small little monotonous steps, but not by your power, not by your might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. I want to restore. He's specifically in Zechariah talking about his temple. Today, our application is he is in the restoration business. And when you see the fact that, that God wants to restore you and me, he wants to restore our families because he sees that basically the, fa the foundational building block in a nation is the family. And if the family crumbles, so does the nation. And he wants to restore that family and he wants to build that family up to strengthen it. And he wants to strengthen a nation when we seek him, when we repent, when we fall on our knees and we pray, God, I need you. We need you as a nation. We need you as a family. I need you as an individual. God, you want to restore. And it's by your power, your might, your spirit 
that that can happen. And when we talk about restoring individuals, when we talk about restoring families, when we talk about restoring the nation, we have to say that the only connector, that pipe between the tree that is God and his love and his mercy and really us who can be restored to have an eternal life with God, the only connector, the only bridge, the only pipe is Jesus Christ. And as we've studied the Old Testament, it's been an amazing thing to see the restoration process. The New Testament says it like this. He doesn't use the word restore. He uses the word reconcile. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all these things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through what? Jesus Christ. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Just substitute the word restoration. Restoration is how you build a temple or a building or a house. Reconciliation is how you mend relationships. How you take a lost person and allow him to have and experience the life-giving, eternal grace and mercy of our heavenly father. Okay, he says he's given us the ministry of reconciliation, verse 19. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them as he has committed us to the word of reconciliation. That's our ministry. That is our goal. When we shine brightly, we're reconciling us to God and the world to God through us and through Jesus working through us. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you, we beg you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is the gospel. And when you look at the Old Testament, the gospel is evident and present in every book. In fact, all 39 of the the books of the Bible point to or have a reference to Christ the Messiah. And it really is the Old Testament pointing us to the need and the love and the mercy and the reconciliation and restoration of Jesus Christ. In Genesis, Jesus was the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our great high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day, fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he is the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's the judge and he's the lawgiver. In Ruth, he's the kinsman redeemer. In 1 and 2 Samuel, he is our trusted prophet. In Nehemiah and Ezra, he's the rebuilder of broken down walls in human life. In Esther, he's our Mordecai. In Job, he's our ever-living redeemer. In Psalms, he is our shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he is our wisdom. In Song of Solomon, he is our loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he's the righteous branch. In Lamentations, he is our weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the wonderful four-faced man. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in life's fiery furnace. In Hosea, he's the faithful husband ever married to the harlot. In Joel, he's the baptizer with the Holy Ghost in the fire. In Amos, he's the burden bearer. In Obadiah, he's mighty to save. In Jonah, he's the great foreign missionary. In Micah, he's the messenger of beautiful feet. In Nahum, he's the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, he's God's evangelist saying, revive thy work in your hour, Lord. In Zephaniah, he's our savior. In Haggai, he's the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Zechariah, he's the fountain opened in the house of David for sin and uncleanliness. And in Malachi, he is the son of righteousness, rising with healing on his wings. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the Old Testament. The Old Testament is creating a need and showing God's people that you cannot do it on your own. 
The Old Testament is 39 books of people trying to live up to a law and failing, failing, and failing. Creating the need. The Old Testament is to bring us to this point. God, I cannot do it on my own. God, I am not worthy. I am not good enough. I cannot live up to the standard that you set. And I need a savior. And save, the savior is Jesus and Jesus alone. The world's gonna tell you something different. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is why we study the Old Testament. And he's why we celebrate when we get to the New Testament. And he's a reason that we remember and worship. 